Good morning and welcome to the study of God's Word. I encourage you to take your Bible right now. Why don't, you, why don't we hold them up together? Uh, hold up your Bible right now, whether it's a book or a phone or an a iPad of some sort. Uh, aren't you so glad that we have God revealing Himself to us in His Word? right? And we get to study that today. We get to dig deep into God's Word today. I'm so excited as we get to do this. And uh, as, as we open our Bibles this morning, let me remind you from John chapter 15, which has been our theme chapter, theme verses this year, uh, some uh, really important words that he said here. Uh, in John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, he says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. We are learning how to abide together. We are learning what it means uh, as a church body together to abide in Jesus Christ. And we've been on this journey through this particular series. Today is the last message of the Abide Together series. We have been learning all year, all of 2020, what it means to abide, and in particular, how to abide in the vine. Notice here it says, I and you, you and me, the idea of this vital connection, that is what it means to abide. And for us to do that, to abide in the vine, I must pursue the things that Jesus loves. And so we've been looking at six of the things that Jesus loves. He loves many things, not just these six. But if you look on the screen here, you'll see fervent prayer. He loves it when we are praying fervently. Passionate worship. Biblical preaching, those are all things that because we are love disciples, we demonstrate our love back to Him in those ways. But we're not just love disciples, we're also sent disciples. And so we see that we need to be purposeful in our discipleship and courageous in evangelism. And today we're going to be looking at what it means to be strategic in church planting. We're going to be talking about our mission. In all of this, we see that these six pursuits are things that we uh, are, are desiring as a church to pursue together. These, these are the things that I'm calling us as a church body, every one of us, to pursue these six things as we seek to be attached to that vital connection with Jesus Christ as we seek to abide. And so today's message uh, is called Strategic Church Planting. If you look at these words, strategic means uh, it means to have a plan that's created to achieve a goal usually over a long period of time. It's how you intend to achieve something. The idea of strategy, strategic, having a plan in advance for what is coming uh, is something that is not often found in a five-year-old playing checkers. Have you ever played checkers with a five-year-old? Like there's not really any strategy involved. They're just, they're just moving the next piece in their, in their mind. They haven't figured out how the game is played and how to think ahead and, and consider the moves that will come, not just the next move, but multiple moves ahead. Strategy is having a plan to achieve a goal. It's thinking ahead on those things and being purposeful uh, in that way. And we want to be strategic when it comes to church planting. Now, just a simple uh, definition for church planting. Church planting is just simply starting new churches that grow in health to the place where they can multiply. And so when it comes to strategic church planting, we need to have a plan about how we will help start new churches that grow into health and multiplication. That's what today's uh, sermon topic is about. And so let me ask a question, though. You think about church planting and you think, well, pastor, that's, that's probably just for you. We know you planted a church a little while ago, but those are for the professional type of people. Those are for people like you, Pastor. For me, just a normal Christian that comes to church and serves in various places, am I supposed to really be about church planting? And today I'm trying to answer the question, how does a regular church member live out this pursuit that Jesus loves so much? Like, how do we live this pursuit of planting churches out today. And t- what we're going to see is that Jesus' love compels me to pursue church planting. That's one of the things I just want you to very clearly understand in today's message. We're going to see that in a moment. We're, we're going to see that if I love what Jesus loves, 
I'm going to purpose to plant churches. I'm going to pray about planting churches. I'm going to proclaim the gospel so that churches are planted. I'm going to pursue these six pursuits in a way that strengthens churches so that they can plan to be involved in strategic church planting. Really, this all comes around one main idea that I want to show us here today, and it's simply this. Jesus' mission to plant churches is my mission too. I want to show you today that Jesus has a mission to to plant churches all around the world until he returns and, and that he has called you and I to be involved in his mission We don't have to have uh, all all sorts of special training. We just simply need to be a believer who loves Jesus. And therefore, we're compelled to get involved in something that Jesus loves. And Jesus loves church planting. So today, I'm going to show this to you from a number of different scriptures. There's not just going to be one scripture that we look at. but, But I'm actually going to trace the theme of church and mission through the New Testament in particular. We, we've been learning how important trace the, this idea of a, tracing a theme in the Bible is through our small group study. In the study that we're doing right now called What is a Healthy Church Member, uh, one of the marks is that we are all biblical theologians, so that we all know how to study God's Word and understand the meaning of the text and how it fits into God's story. Like every one of us has the ability and should be pursuing that. And one of the ways that we learn how to be good at studying the Word in that way is to look at the themes, not just a chapter of the Bible, but looking at a topic through a number of different places in Scripture. And so that's what we're going to do here today. So to help us, I'm going to guide us through three questions, three questions to clarify our mission. And so question number one is this, what is our mission? I mean, what is it that this mission is? What is it that we are supposed to be doing? And and we start, I want to start us out by looking at what our church's mission statement actually is, and then launch us into how that mission statement is really born right out of Jesus's mission in this way. And so Harvest Kale's mission statement, we have been saying recently uh, that we are to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. But we've kind of tweaked things a little bit and now have a little bit more of a clear statement. I think it helps us a little bit. Uh, We want to glorify God by making disciples who are loved and sent. And so why is it that we need a mission statement? Why, Why do we need a statement like this? Well, any good organization has a mission statement because it defines what they do. It states why they exist. And for us, we say we exist because we want to glorify God by by fulfilling the Great Commission, by making disciples who are loved and sent. And and so that's an important thing for us to be able to stay on track and stay on mission and stay doing the things that we're called to. Uh, a mission statement defines what we do, and, and it's kind of like any, anything. If we were to uh, get re- very hungry, and my, man, I could really use a hamburger right now, and, and we were downtown walking around, and we walked into the H&M store, and we're like, I'm so hungry. Could, could I please have a hanger, ha- hamburger? Could you please, uh, could I please purchase a burger? Well, the store reps would laugh at us and say, well, that, that, sir, that's not what we do here. This is, this is a clothing store. We, we don't sell hamburgers. And so I walk out of the store and, and, I, and, and I walk down the street a little bit and I realize, man, I'm hungry, but I, I really, the purpose I'm here is to buy a new shirt. And so I walk into McDonald's and I walk up to the counter and I, would, and I say, ma'am, I would like to purchase a new shirt. Where could I do that in your store? Again, The woman will laugh at you and say, that's not our purpose. That's not our mission. That's not what we do. We sell hamburgers cheap and fast. And so in that, you realize we get the clarity of understanding what we're supposed to be about by having a mission statement. Ours is that we are seeking to glorify God by making disciples who are loved and sent. And that means there are lots of good things that we could be involved in as a church, but we choose to stay within these boundaries. We, we choose to stay within the boundaries of glorifying God and, and, and the Great Commission, the mission of Jesus Christ. So today I want to really talk about the second part of our mission statement, this idea of the Great Commission and making disciples who are loved and sent. I want us to get a better understanding by tracing the theme of mission throughout Scripture 
uh, beginning with what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16. And so we're going to look here today at a number of scriptures I'm going to lead us through to show us this theme. The first, as I said, is Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 18. Uh, and in this passage of scripture, we see uh, that Jesus has asked the disciples who people say that he is. And they say he's a prophet and all, they come up with all sorts of half true, true answers. And then Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, uh, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He, he correctly identifies who Jesus is. And, and upon that, Jesus answers him and tells him that it wasn't his own thinking. It was God who, helped, who actually revealed that to him. And then he says, as a result of it, Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says that our, the declaration of who Jesus is, the proper understanding of who Jesus is, becomes the foundation for building the church. Now, this is the first time in the Bible that the word church is used. And notice it comes off the lips of Jesus. It's Jesus starting something brand new that hasn't, hadn't been in effect. You never see a church in the Old Testament. He was working through a nation. Uh, that nation rejected him. So now he's working through uh, people who are called by his name, who properly understand who he is. And those people are put into the church. So in this, we see that Jesus is a master builder who is building his church. And we understand that he's building our church when we're submissive servants who know that he's building us, when we're surrendered stewards who know that we belong to Jesus, and when we're serious soldiers who know that we are in a battle with Christ and for his purposes. Jesus is the master builder and he is building his church. This is the very beginning of tracing this theme. But what we find is that Jesus begins to tell us more about his mission to build the church, uh, not uh, after his, his death, burial, and resurrection. So if you know the story of Jesus, he lived a perfect life, and then he took the sins of the world and, and went up on the cross willingly and died for our sins, and God's wrath was poured out. Uh, it should have been poured on us, but it was poured on Jesus. He bore the burdens so that if we repent and change our minds and believe that he is the Savior, we have forgiveness of sins. It's a wonderful thing. Jesus rose from the dead and over the course of 40 days from the time of his resurrection until the time he ascended into heaven, he spoke to his closest disciples, the, the 11 disciples who were remaining. And on five different occasions, in five different places, to five different groups of people, he gave uh, the, the mission that we are called to in parts, in little snippets, if you will. And he gave a little bit the first time, and then he added to it the second time, and then built on that the third time, and so on. And so I want to show you these things. If you were to look at the chronology of what happened in the 40 days that G, between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension back into heaven, you would see him mostly recorded talking about the mission we would see, first of all, the model. We, we see the model for, that we are to follow after in the mission. And we see this in John chapter 20, verse 21. In this verse, we, we see uh, that Jesus, on the evening of Resurrection Sunday, speaks to 10 disciples because Thomas is missing at this point. These 10 disciples are hiding up in a room, afraid of what is going to happen to them. They're confused and they're scared. And Jesus knows that they can't handle hearing the fullness of the mission in one setting. He, he can't tell them everything he needs to tell them in one, in this very first time that he's seeing them after the resurrection. So he graciously gives them only a small piece. Notice what he says in John 20, 21. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus here tells them one simple fact. He says, my followers have a mission. That, that's all that he's saying here. You as my disciples, I am sending you out. Just like the Father sent me to earth, I am sending you into the world to carry my message uh, with you. And so we are sent into the world, notice sent into, not, not that people would come to us, 
Uh, not like the nation of Israel who were told uh, to have people come to them, but instead we are to go to the nations and, and with the mission of Jesus Christ. So uh, some things that, are just two things I quickly notice about uh, people who are sent in this verse. The first is this. There, there's a confidence that comes because we know Jesus is sending us. This isn't like somebody's thinking and best practices thing. Like, like we can have the courage to go because Jesus has made the command to send us. We can also have internal peace because the matter is settled. We don't have to wonder what we're supposed to do. We can have the conviction to go and to make disciples of Jesus because he's told us, I'm sending you. I'm sending you with this purpose. So we see the model uh, here, but, we, but the next time that Jesus uh, shows us, uh, eight days later, again in the city of Jerusalem, in another room where Thomas is currently present, we see that Jesus gives us the magnitude of the mission. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it helps us to see this. Actually, uh, if you're doing a good study of Scripture, you'll see in John uh, 20, verse 26, that eight days later the disciples were inside and Thomas was with them. You can match that up with uh, Mark 16, verse 14, where it says that he appeared to the 11 disciples, so clearly different than the first time that he appeared to the disciples in John 20, 21. The second time in Mark 16, verse 15, records this. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So, so here we see that the size is, first of all, global. He says, go into all the world. And the Greek word there means every geographic region. And then he says, proclaim the gospel. And then he says something at the end, to the whole creation, which is actually a different Greek word than every geographic location, it's actually to every single individual. So the mission is, uh, the magnitude of the mission, the size of the mission is global in nature, but it's to every person in size as well. In this, we see here uh, two marks of people who are sent. First, they're going to have to be strategic. If we're going to reach every single geographic re region, we need a plan. And then also we need to be empathetic. If we're going to reach every single person, we need to have compassion for people that Jesus had. So we see the magnitude of the mission in Mark chapter 16. But then we see Jesus stacks up and he gives us a little bit more of a piece two weeks later. We know it's two weeks later because they're up on a mountain in Galilee. And in Mark, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 28 is where this is recorded. If you look at verse 16, it says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they're on the mountain, notice what he says in verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We see here the method that Jesus gives the disciples to carry out the mission. We've seen that the model is Jesus. The magnitude is to every geographic place and every person in the world. But now the method a method is a procedure to accomplish a mission. And notice what he says here, that the main verb in this text is to make disciples. The method is disciple making. We're, we're told not just what the method is that, that we are to accomplish, but even how to do it. It says, go therefore, and really the tense of the verb is, is better translated, as you are going. In other words, wherever you are going in the world. Sometimes people need to be specially sent to a place, but other times it's just wherever it is that God has, has taken you in the world, you are to make disciples. Notice that disciples are made when they, when they then are baptized. There's a conversion because they understand the gospel and they're baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. And then finally, it tells us that we are to teach them to observe everything that Jesus commanded them. We are to teach them to be followers of Jesus who know what Jesus says and to, and to put that into practice. 
and all of that on either side of what Jesus tells us at the top, he says, I'm giving you the authority to do this. And then he promises his presence in that as well. He says, the method is you're going to go make disciples by, by wherever you're going, preaching the gospel, baptizing people into the church, and then discipling them up into strong believers. Uh, you have the authority to do it, and I'm with you in the process. Then we see, fourth, the message that we are to carry with us. And this is revealed chronologically next in, in Luke chapter 24. We see here that this is, again, uh, about a couple, another week after the time that they're on the mountain because they're back in Jerusalem. It would have taken about uh, five days to, to make that journey, a couple of days to make that journey in, in that particular time. And then notice in verse 49, it says, I am sending the, uh, the promise Holy Spirit of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. They, they are back in the city of Jerusalem. And so this is the fourth time chronologically when Jesus gives a great commission statement, when he tells us the mission. And notice what he says. He, he, he gives us the message in, in verse 46 and 47. He says to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that re repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. We see the message that we are to carry is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is this, that the, Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament who is coming not as a conquering king, but as one who was going to suffer, take on the pain of the sins of the world on himself. But on the third day after his death, he was going to rise from the dead, demonstrating that he conquers sin and death so that those who put their trust in him can receive repentance and forgiveness of sins. When, when we repent, when we change our minds about who Jesus is and how to have a relationship with God and how to be whole ourselves, then we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We are to proclaim this message to all nations. Now in this, I think you begin to realize that we can't do this on our own. It's impossible to do this on our own. And so that's why the, Jesus the fifth time gives us uh, the, 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 the means that we are to do this. The means of the mission is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, before we get to verse 8, notice verse 3. It says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. That, that's what we've seen so far up to this point. That's a summary statement of what I've just explained to you. And then down in verse 8, it says, in these last moments when they're out on the mount called Olivet, according to verse 12 here, we see here that Jesus says this, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So notice here the means of the mission going forward is you and the Holy Spirit. Notice that three times in this verse the word you is emphasized. That, that's repeated three times. That's actually quite a bit for one verse. And so clearly he is saying, you believers, followers of Jesus, you are going to be the means, the, 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 the way that this is going to move forward. But, but it's not going to be in your strength. You're going to need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need to trust the Holy Spirit. You're going to trust the Holy Spirit for his permanent presence. You need to trust the Holy Spirit for his predominant power. You need to trust the Holy Spirit for his purposeful plan. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. His plan is to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ using you empowered by the Holy Spirit. So did it happen? Did what Jesus say before he ascended, I mean, he, he ascends into the clouds right after this. Did the disciples actually do the mission of Jesus? Did what Jesus promised actually happen? Well, turn a page over to Acts chapter 2 and we see the manifestation of the mission. We see that it did indeed happen, that all of Jesus' words came true. They manifest and, and came true exactly as Jesus said. Acts chapter 2 is the story of the day of Pentecost. 
50 days after Jesus' resurrection, we see that the Spirit lights the flame and the church is born. And Peter, this is the way it happens. Peter begins preaching to a crowd who confusingly think that they're drunk. But the Holy Spirit is on top of them and he explains to them. He shows the plan of Jesus Christ in verses 1 to 35. And then he calls people to follow Jesus in verses 36 to 41. And then they begin to function together as a church in verses 42 to 47. Look at Acts 2, 41. It says this, So those who received his word, Peter's preaching, were baptized. That, that means they, they converted and they entered the church. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So, so what we see here is that the church begins. The, it's the story of the beginning of the church. And really, the book of Acts then tells us how the church didn't just begin with this group of 3,000, but that it multiplied and, and more people came to that church. And then more, uh, more churches had to be planted. And it actually it went all around uh, the known world at that time. The reason is because Jesus' mission is to build the church. Did Jesus accomplish what he said he would do? Yes. Did the disciples do what Jesus told them to do? Absolutely. And what we see in the books of, book of Acts is the primary story of how the church expanded past the first generation of disciples and into the second generation of the mission using a man named Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, as an apostle, was told that he had a particular and special mission that he was called to, and that was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 3, he tells us about this. He says in verse 7, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, the manifold wisdom, the many different sides of God's wisdom might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places." This is an amazing verse that helps us to understand that the church is at the center of God's plan. The church is how God displays his wisdom everywhere. The church is the showpiece of the gospel. And so Paul, in his mission to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, doesn't just tell people about Jesus. We see in his story, he tells them about Jesus and then he puts them into a church that grows to be healthy and strong reproduces some leaders, and makes witness to others as well. If we see this in the pattern in Paul's first, first missionary journey, if we were to look at Acts chapter 13, we would see uh, this story play out uh, in amazing form. We see in Acts chapter 13 that Paul is at Antioch, uh, a church that has grown strong through the teaching of the gospel for about a year. They are, Paul and Barnabas are set aside and they go, uh, they're told to be sent out into a missionary journey. And we see that they move from Antioch on mission to Cyprus and then to Antioch and Poseida, Iconium to Lystra to Derbe. And all through that, they're preaching the gospel. They're, they're making sure that those who believe the gospel are gathered together into a group called a church and making sure it's strong. And then they're putting leaders into place. The summary of this is Acts 14, verse 21 to 23. It says this, When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Notice Paul's pattern. Paul's pattern was to proclaim the gospel, to strengthen the believers, and to appoint elders. Jesus' mission is to build his church, and the church is at the heart of what he wants. Listen, we can't say that we're on mission if it's just about me. If I don't believe that I'm responsible and need to change people. We, we can't say we're on mission if it's just about a social change. We, we want change, but it misses the gospel. We can't say that it's just about Jesus and we don't see the church as central to God's plan. Jesus is building his church 
and he wants you to participate with him. So how do we do that? How do I participate in the Christ mission to build his church? That's question number two here today. How do I pursue Christ's mission to plant churches? Let's look at five practical ways that we are to participate in strategic mission. Listen, I've, I've tried to show you that, that the mission of Jesus Christ is to plant churches. That he said, I will build my church. And he sends us. And he tells us to go everywhere. He tells us the method is to make disciples. He tells us the message is the gospel. He tells us that we need the Holy Spirit power. But what is the result? It's a church in Acts chapter 2. And then throughout the book of Acts, we see the multiplication of churches as Paul goes around and many of the other apostles do the same and plant churches all throughout the world. And in that, they don't just have special giftings to do that. Every believer is gifted to build the church. We learned that two weeks ago. And, and this is ways that we are, practical ways that we, every single believer, it doesn't have to be a specially trained pastor. It can just be a regular member of the church should be participating in the strategic planting of churches as part of our mission. So here's number one. Practical way number one is, is, is we need to purpose to participate in church planting. So, so the idea of, of purposing to do something is the idea of, of being intentional and, and to have an objective, to have something that you're trying to achieve. And to do that, to, to be purposeful in this, I believe that we need to, first of all, be convinced that Christ has a plan. That's what I'm trying to build in you right now. I'm trying to build in you this right here. Be convinced that Jesus is on mission to plant churches, to build churches, and that he's called you to be involved in the process. But not only that, we also need to get informed of the need to plant churches. So, so let's just talk a little bit about our city right here. Kuala Lumpur in the middle of Malaysia. It's a beautiful city. I love this city. And, and the city of KL is, is growing expansively and, and very quickly. And, and, and many estimates uh, suggest that the Greater Klang Valley uh, is growing to a place where it's almost 10 million in population. If you were to look at a graph of that and you were to look at the different, uh, peop different religions represented by those 9 million coming soon to be 10 million people, you would see the little white box says there's 3% of those that are Christians in our city. 3%, only 3% know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and are participating in churches. Like, like that right there, you should be informed of the need. That should break your heart. That there's 97% of the people here who, who are held bound because they don't understand properly who Jesus is. If we were to look at the need that we have to plant churches and we were to see how the church is growing, we would see uh, that we, we need to plant 360 new churches in order to keep up with the population growth of the city. That, that's, we need to plant one church every day. One average sized church in the city of Kale is 50 people. We need to plant 360 churches of an average side of 50 people. We need to plant one every day just to keep up with the population growth of this urban center. We, we need to purpose to be involved in this. There's a second step. I, I think we need to pray. Prayer is dependence upon God. And prayer is crying out to God and saying, God, would you help me to see the need? Would you help me to be convinced of your plan so that I can purpose to participate in your mission? Can you, can, can you humble yourself to a spot where you say, God, what do you want to do with me? What did you place me on earth to do? And, and, and when you begin to see that he has a passion for the mission of planting churches and he wants every one of us involved in that process, Hang on just a second, I'll explain how. It should break our hearts and begin to cause us to get involved. And getting involved will begin to show you I'm weak and, and I'm not really able to do this. And I don't know where even to begin. You begin with prayer. God, break my heart for this. And then when you begin to realize that the ability to do this is outside of your strength and ability, you cling to the things that Jesus has said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and you have the gospel message. And if you go about the way, the plan that I have, the method of making disciples, like if you preach the gospel everywhere, I'm going to do a work 
to put people into churches. Here's the third practical way to participate in strategic church planting. We need to proclaim the gospel. I mean, this is the pattern that Paul tells us in Acts 14. That the first thing he would do in every place is that he would preach the gospel to that city. Not everybody in the city would believe, but those who did, he would gather into churches. Listen, it's the preaching of the gospel that causes people to hear the reality that they're broken and they need Jesus Christ and and that they can have that salvation, the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ and be back in relationship with God, placed into his family and then into his church. We need to proclaim, listen, everywhere, courageous evangelism. We need to be proclaiming the gospel. And then number four, we need to, we need to pursue the pursuits. <laughs> the, the pursuits. Listen, so many times people think, well, church planting, oh, that's such a hard thing to do. Folks, I'm here to tell you, the, the pursuits, the, the, the six things that Jesus loves that we are gathering around in this Abide Together series. Listen, if we would passionately pursue these things that Jesus loves, if we would fervently pray and passionately worship and biblically preach and purposefully disciple and courageously evangelize, church planting is going to happen. Like, like we need to get the church strengthened, uh, united in the things of the Holy Spirit, grown up and mature as believers here as we, as we preached a couple of weeks ago. It, it, this is not unobtainable. Every believer listening can participate in church planting simply by pursuing the things that Jesus loves, these pursuits that we're studying. And then lastly, number five, five practical ways to participate in the church, strategic church planting is plan. A plan requires that there be some organization. <laughs> a plan is taking chaotic things and adding some order to it. And, and many times when we add order to something, we need somebody to lead. And so that's why Paul says, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to strengthen the church. And then I'm going to appoint leaders, appoint elders. It really, we, we need to be using our gifts to serve the church and some are going to be called to, to organize us and to help lead us. We need a plan to be involved in the maturing of the faith. Listen, so that leaders might be sent out from us to plant other churches and then they can be replaced by you because you're a mature believer. You need to be purposefully discipled and grown up in these things. And as we plan together as a church to say, listen, the mission that Jesus has is to build this church and he wants us on mission with him. I've got to get busy about these pursuits. I'm going to plan to be involved in this. It's not just going to be at the bottom of my list. I'm going to be intentional and strategic to be involved in these things. Here at Harvest KL, we're actually involved in two different organizations because we believe in this idea of planning to be involved in church plants. We haven't planted a church ourselves, but we've been involved in quite a few church plants. Through Gospel City Network, which is the city network that we have right here in Kuala Lumpur, there's about 30 plus different churches and through training and coaching and and doing seminars, the body of Christ is being built. Uh, about five churches have already been planted through that through Gospel City Network and more are in the pipeline and on the way. We participate globally in the Great Commission Collective. So we have a, a city network, Gospel City Network, and we have a global network partnership called Great Commission Collective, and that's about 120 churches around the world of which we are a member. Uh, We were part of when our church became Harvest and now are part of that as well because we're planning to be participate. As a point of application, I just want to encourage you in this, just a simple word, participate. We've been asking, what are practical ways to, or seeing how, what are practical ways to be involved in strategic church planting? And I've been trying to help us understand it doesn't take some special calling or some special training as a seminary pastor of some sort. Every member of our church can participate in the mission of Jesus Christ. If you're going to participate, you first need to find your starting point. Now, now maybe you already are, are well down the way here. You're, you're like, I'm in the plan stage. I'm in the growing into leadership stage. Or, or maybe some of you are really at the very beginning. I, I still need to be convinced so, so that I'm intentional about the objective of church planting. No matter where you are, look at the five different practical ways and, and maybe identify what, what stage are you at. And then you need to begin to move to the next level. Listen, if, if you need to be convinced about purpose 
purposefully participating. This message, hopefully, is helping by the Holy Spirit. We can talk some more and try to get a better understanding. Maybe you're at the prayer stage where you're just beginning, God, show me how to be involved. Or maybe you're like, man, I, I need to tell some people about Jesus and, and bring them into the church so, so that they hear the gospel. I, I, I need to, I, maybe you're about the pursuits already. Listen, these are all obtainable steps for every single one of us to participate in. We've been looking at this idea of strategic church planting and asking two questions so far to clarify the mission. There's one more question that I want us to consider, and the question is this. Who cares? Who cares about church planting? Well, what we see is uh, maybe a, a question that's a little bit more clarifying is, should church planting matter to me? When, I, when you ask, Pastor, who cares? Should church planting matter? To me, because I struggle with that. If we're honest, I see the truth. I see that Jesus has a mission and that he wants me on it, but I'm not doing anything about it. You showed me five practical ways to be involved and I'm not involved in any of those things. And actually, I'm not even convinced. If I'm honest, I'm just distracted by a lot of things in life. And and maybe really the reality is to prick a little deeper, I'm pretty self-centered and self-consumed with all of my things that I would never really love the things that Jesus loves here. I think what we begin to see when we examine our hearts is that the problem is not that I can't do these things, but that I don't want to. And therefore, it becomes a heart issue. You might be struggling with that right now. Pastor, I'm hearing you preach. I really don't like what you're saying. Pastor, I'm hearing you preach. I know you're right, but man, I, I, don't, I don't really even want to get involved, let alone know where to start. Pastor, I hear you, I'm not, but I'm not motivated. I'm not, the Spirit is not lighting within me this desire that, that I see this so clear that's on God's heart. And so you're asking, who cares? But not in like, who cares and who needs to be about it? You're like, who cares? Strategic church planning, who cares? And you're saying, I don't really care. I mean, you're shrugging your shoulders. You're not really asking the question, who cares? You're saying, I don't care because I know I won't do it. And I think what we need to wrestle with is at the core of that kind of thinking is I want to be first. I want to love myself. I want to be about myself. I want to be first. But the statement that we're making all throughout this series is, if I love the things Jesus loves, I will pursue the things he pursues. What we're seeing is that there's really a love issue here. That if I love the things Jesus loves, if I love Jesus, I'm going to love the things he loves. If if I'm seeing, really it's an evaluation statement, right? If I'm not pursuing the things Jesus loves, turn the statement around, then I maybe don't love the thing Jesus loves and don't really love him. What does Jesus love? Well, Jesus loves the church. Ephesians chapter 5 is very clear about this. In one little statement, he's actually talking about his whole plan for the church and he's using marriage as an illustration. In Ephesians 5 chapter 25, he tells the husbands how they're supposed to love their wives. It's really an illustration because really it's about Christ and the church, we eventually find out. But in Ephesians 5 25, he says, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Do you see what the statement says? Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church. How do we know that Christ loved the church? It's because of his sacrifice. It's because he's given himself up for her. You know what someone loves when they sacrifice for that individual or person. So there's a story that was in a, that's in a book written by Dave Simmons that, where he talks about uh, his children and how he was teaching his children uh, how uh, a family value uh, about love and how love is action. He took his eight-year-old daughter, Helen, and his five-year-old son, Brandon, to the store, to a mall where there was a store. He had to do some hardware store shopping. As they drove up, the kids weren't excited because the hardware store is never exciting, but they saw a big sign on the side of a truck that said, Petting petting Zoo. The kids jumped up and asked, Daddy, Daddy, can we go? Please, please, can we go? 
And he thought, sure. And he gave them each a quarter, uh, 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 just a, a 25 cent to, to be able to walk into the petting zoo. Now, a petting zoo is, it has a fence around it and it has like six inches of sawdust and lots of furry little animals that don't hurt kids that you can sit there and you can pet them. And the, the kids pay their money and they walked into the, the fenced in area while, uh, while he went and began shopping in the hardware store. But not long after that, he turned around and his daughter was standing there. He was shocked to see that she preferred to be shopping in the hardware store rather than in the petting zoo. She, she was somebody who loved little animals and, and, and spent lots of time with them. In her sad, giant brown eyes, she, she, she said, Daddy, it cost 50 cents. So I gave my quarter to Brandon, her brother. He writes, she said, the most beautiful thing I ever heard. She repeated our family motto, love is action. She gave her little brother the quarter, even though she loved to be in a petting zoo and she loved to do those things because she heard us say, love is action. She watched us put into practice love in action for years around the house. She had seen love in action and now had incorporated it into her little lifestyle. It had become part of this little girl. So what do you think he did? Well, not what you might think he did. As soon as he finished shopping and all of those things, they walked over to the fenced area where the petting zoo was and they watched her little brother go crazy petting and feeding the animals. The daughter stood there, her hands resting on her chin, uh, leaning against the fence, watching her little brother. As a father, he says, I had 50 cents in my pocket and it was burning a hole. I wanted to give it to her, but I never did offer it to her, offer it to her and she never asked. And that's because she knew the whole family motto. It's not love is action, it's love is sacrificial action. He says, love always pays a price. Love always costs something. Love is expensive. When you love, benefits accrue in another person's account. Love is for you, not for me. Love gives, it doesn't grab. My daughter gave her quarter to her brother and wanted to follow through with her lesson. She knew she had to taste the sacrifice. She wanted to experience the totality of the family model. Love is sacrificial action. This reminds me of a story that Jesus told. In Matthew 19, the story is recorded of the rich young ruler. We, we see in this story that a man came to him and said, Teacher, what must I do to have, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now, this young man should have known at that moment he was being set up. But in his youthful exuberance, he continued and said to him, Which ones? What commandments? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, with very little self-awareness, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. In other words, he didn't take Jesus up on the offer. The problem he had here, it says, is that he had great possessions. But, but it's kind of a trick because the problem was not that he had possessions, but that the possessions had him. It was a heart problem. Jesus was pointing out to him. It wasn't about keeping the commandments. It was about your heart and your heart is deceitful. You don't even see that you've broken these commandments. He, he loved himself so much that he couldn't see what a pure and true love for Christ and following his commandments all, all was. Jesus points that out when he said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, it's not being rich that's the problem. It's that if your heart is enraptured by the, by the wealth and it possesses you, then you can't have Jesus. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with this man, with, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. 
So, so the rich young ruler walks away because he realizes he doesn't want to give up his possessions. He has a heart problem. But Jesus goes on to say that with man, it's impossible to change your heart. But with me, I can change your heart. I can change what you love. I can change your heart from, from, from possessions having you to you not being enslaved by those possessions. Peter says, well, we don't have possessions don't have us. He says, see, we've left everything to follow you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive one hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus says, What you give up and lose to love the things that I love will not be counted as a loss. You will have 100 fold in this life and you will have an inheritance in eternity. The sacrifice that you think that you're making here will cause you to be given first things, greater things. Listen, church planting matters to me when I love what Jesus loves. And that means when I sacrificially give up my self-centeredness and say, God, I'm going to pursue the things that you love. You love the church. You love more churches. I'll give myself up for that. That problem that I have, that I won't do these things, that heart issue that says, who cares? At the, the core of that is that I want to be first, but you say the first will be last and the last will be first. I'm going to, God, help me to repent and believe these things to be true right now. That means this, my application, we must learn to love Jesus. Really, if we're going to do any of these pursuits, but in particular, this idea of church planning, we have to learn to love Jesus. And Jesus loves the church and he's sacrificially giving himself up for the body of believers. He speaks in a way that's very difficult and hard for the rich young, young ruler. But in doing so, he lovingly confronts this young man and points out his heart issue. Listen, is Jesus pointing out any heart issue in your life right now? Is Jesus pointing out any way that you're resisting the thing that he loves? That is churches and the building of churches, the multiplication of churches throughout our world today. Are you resistant to that? Are you, are you obnoxious about that? Are you putting up obstacles saying, I can't be involved in those things? You look at the practical things and you go, I'm not going to do that. You look at the reasoning of the mission and how Jesus unfolds it and you're like, I don't care about that. Listen, if that's where your heart has been, Jesus is saying these words to you so that you'll repent, that you'll change your mind, let you'll cry out to him and say, God, I know I even need to change my mind and I won't fully do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. God, would you help me repent? Because even in the repenting, I can't fully do it in my own strength. And would you just confess to him right now anything that's holding you back from the idea of being sent into the mission of planting churches, of being involved in that process? Listen, I've shown you every believer can be involved in this? Would you repent if your heart is not ready for it? And then would you believe Jesus' mission is to plant churches? Would you believe that he has called you to that same mission as well? And then would you begin to live these things out? That means that you'll participate, that, that you'll purpose with intentionality and strategy, you, you will set your life up to be involved in the process of planting churches, which means you're praying for churches to be planted and you're praying to be used to that end, that you're proclaiming the gospel to a world, to a city that desperately needs it, that you're pursuing the things that God loves in prayer and worship and preaching, discipleship and evangelism, and then the mission itself. And then that you're planning to be involved, that you're putting the plan into action of being involved in those things. Listen, if you have trouble with that, you need to learn to love Jesus. Because this is, a, this is the statement I want to make. Jesus' mission is to plant churches, and that's my mission too. I'm going to love the things he loves, and he loves planting churches. 
So as we conclude this message and really conclude this series, we have been learning that we need to abide together. That abiding, while there's individual responsibility, all of us together should be attaching ourselves to the vine of Jesus Christ. We must learn to love what Jesus loves and to pursue the things that he pursues. Because he first loved us, we now are loved disciples who can reflect love back to him. Think about how he loved us. He gave us access to him through fervent prayer. He opened the heavens so that we could see his glory and worship him and ascribe worth and magnify him in passionate worship. He, he gave us his word so that we can hear from him through biblical preaching. Notice that those who are loved by Jesus also then have been served by him. And those who have been served by him, they want to serve Jesus and others as well. So they, they want to be in purposeful discipleship. They want to be pursuing the unity of the spirit and the maturing and building up of the church. They, they want to be inviting new people into the church through evangelism because we're convinced it's our responsibility and confident it's our role and clear about the message. And then we see that Jesus's mission is the church. And that he has called us to be involved in that mission. Listen, we are loved and sent. We, we are disciples who want to glorify God because he's made us a disciple who's loved and sent and who we are called to be sent to help that he, show that he loves others as well. These six pursuits describe the kind of church that we want to be. It's the kind of church that he wants planted. It's the kind of church he wants us to be participating fully in for the purpose of building more churches. In this, we can thank the Lord for all that he has given to us. We can praise him for what he has done. That, that in all of this, we can see that he's the king of kings and, and he's the one that designed the church. He's the one that did all the work to make that possible. And so we can say, praise him. Praise our God, Father, Son, and Spirit for he has loved us and sent us, and we have great purpose as a result. Let's ask God to pursue these things together even now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word again today. It is precious to us, and as we held it up at the beginning, Lord, help us to hold it up in our lives now by how we live it out. God, our desire today is that you would help us to see that you are, you have a mission and your mission is the church and you've called us to be involved in it. God, would, would you convince us that your mission is our mission, each one of us individually responsible to be involved and participating. Lord, if there's any hole in our belief in that, in our activity of that, would you turn our eyes to you to help us to love you in a brand new way? Lord, as we sing this last song, would you create by your spirit a greater love for you and then obedience to what you've called us to in these things. Lord, we want to be a church that abides together, that pursues you and the things that you love. God, would you make us so? It's in Christ's name. Amen.